Fat CPD Show. My name is Chris and I'll be your host for today and today my guest is Pastor Paul Reed. Paul is the Manchester campus pastor for Audacious Church with his wife Zoe uh, which comprises three locations and six services reaching 3,000 people per week. Paul and Zoe have been married for 25 years and they have three kids. Pastor Paul welcome to the show it's great to have you on. Thank you very much Chris. I don't know about you but um I reckon, and there's absolutely no science in about what in what I'm about to say, but I reckon there's about a third of the church away every Sunday. I think that is absolutely true. I reckon yeah. if you looked at, you know, database compared to um, compared to attendance, I reckon yeah. that's about right. Yeah, I think post COVID, definitely in America, it was more like half of the church away every Sunday or absent. Because people go kind of like, you know, maybe every other week or less than that, actually. But for us in our church, again, I haven't done a register. However, I think there's about a third of the church away every Sunday. So we're we're looking at ways to improve that. I say that just because you were talking about our attendance and I was just like, yeah, but don't forget... It, I th- well, it's a great point. I think for any church, uh, any church minister listening to this, you know, the, yeah, your attendance is only ever going to be one small uh, metric. And often, off, you know, it's always been the traditionally the one that everyone says, you know, how big's your church and all that kind of thing. But there's so many more things that go into it. So I think you're absolutely right on that. On that point, we do yeah. we do measure. Sorry, we're getting right into it. Sorry, we we'll are. <laughs> dessert in a minute. No, but I was just going to say we do measure a lot of things against Sunday attendance. So like for us, we'd do small group attendance as a percentage of Sunday yeah. attendance. You know, we'd do, you know, other things related to that. Anyway, let's not talk about that. Well, we, I mean, we could have gone straight into, um, yeah, having stats as a big kind of conversation. Welcome to the Church Stats podcast. But <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Let's go, let's get back to uh, uh, dessert and development yes. uh, and all those kind of things. So uh, well, maybe we'll we'll do another podcast another day about uh, church stats, and we'll just it'll be like kind of you, me, and all the church nerds. Yeah, will, uh, okay. will listen to it, which actually I think would be probably uh, do rather well. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Well, we are uh, we are here to talk about development today, uh, but of course it goes without saying we must talk about dessert first. So, uh, Paul, talk to me about the dessert that you've brought with you. Okay, so I definitely spent time thinking about this and I'm definitely of an old school like category. I'm choosing from old school options. So I'm thinking rice pudding. I'm thinking semolina. Do you even know what that is, Chris? Um, Slightly, yes. Okay, blancmange, (laughs) right? These are like stuff you could get at primary school for dessert or we call it pudding up here um so it's in that category but i haven't said it yet so my chosen dessert and this is because i asked my wife what's my favorite dessert and she said well what would you choose in a restaurant and i said okay i know what it is and it's always ice cream okay just plain simple i don't mean plain in flavor i mean like i don't need a brownie with it i don't need like even sprinkles on it i don't need it cake with it i just a bowl with three scoops of ice cream is just like i've got reserves in my stomach for that <laughs> but i can be full right and like i'm never gonna eat again i'm considering taking off my trousers in this restaurant because i'm so <laughs> full but then they go do you want to see what ice cream we have and it's like there's just another tummy especially for that yeah i i understand and at the end of a a meal you don't often i i'm I'm kind of getting to the point where i don't want a a big crumble or i don't want a big you know something that's too stodgy so an ice cream is a really good choice so i think we need to dive a little bit more into this talk to me about so is it that you just go for vanilla or are there particular flavors that you go for no there's a genre of flavors right anything in the caramel toffee fudge honeycomb arena okay yep right so just for anyone who's ever gonna listen to this and then buy me ice cream chocolate ice cream 
is of the devil. We don't like chocolate ice cream. Chocolate is beautiful. Ice cream is awesome. The combo to no, we don't want chocolate ice cream. Vanilla is good if you can have some toffee sauce. That's like that's nice. Do you know what? Yeah. And actually, chocolate sauce on vanilla ice cream is also acceptable. But I'm thinking ice cream that's got some pieces in it, but not fruit. If I wanted to be healthy, I would have had a fruit salad. I'm talking about a chunk of fudge, a piece of toffee, some kind of caramel. Come on now. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a good genre. I do like all that kind of honeycomb stuff. I also am a fan of uh, you know plain vanilla, but with a toffee sauce. Have you heard there's a new trend that is going around uh, uh, amongst amongst the kids, which is putting olive oil on ice cream. Have you heard of this? No. How my egg? Sounds like witchcraft to me. So the, there's there's two. There's putting olive oil and salt. I've heard of that one. And yeah. the other one I've heard of is olive oil and maple syrup, and you whisk it together. To make a kind of no, I mean, it just sounds wrong, doesn't it? Okay, so there's two things that I put on ice cream that I thought you were going to say because they're not very conventional, and I do get stick for doing this, right? I uh, but not but none of them are weirdly savory items like olive oil. One yeah. is a little bit of milk, just okay. like. The ice cream's out of, obviously fresh out of the freezer. So you just pour a little bit of milk on it and it literally freezes. It becomes like a little bit of like sauce, which I think is nice. And then also, and this is, this is weird. I understand this is to put a big scoop of ice cream, frozen, obviously into a bowl of hot custard. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Come on. That's uh, see, I don't think that's too, uh, too crazy at all. In fact, okay. Who was it? Well, I was talking. I think it was Meshek was talking okay. about. Um, he would have a a sticky toffee pudding, and it creates a kind of island where you have the uh, you have the uh, what, what, it was it was on the podcast he was talking to me about it, and you have the custard one side, and then the ice cream the other side. Oh right, and, and then you allow it to kind of you know merge together. I think that that yeah, ice cream and custard go very well together. I Good hear choice. you, Michek. I hear you. I would just take out the pudding and just put that in the bin <laughs> and just eat, eat the remaining mush. Sounds good no. to me. Yeah, very, very good. I'm, a, I'm a, obviously a big fan of ice cream, uh, and I do like those flavors. I'm, a, I'm also. I mean, it, obviously, it's different times. If you're, if you're in a restaurant, then you, I might go for one kind of flavor. But if I'm in, you know, if I'm a, by a beachfront and I want to, then it might be it's something good. slightly different. So it's it, good. yeah. But I am a fan of you know the the classic vanillas, but I do like a kind of a mint choc chip as well. Um, so I always always like that one for some reason. So yes, I think that's a great a great addition. Ice cream, plain and simple, love it. Okay, great. Um, that's the dessert. Let's go on to uh, the resources that you've got. Should we uh, talk about your first one? Yeah, I've 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 got three books right that I'm gonna um, highlight as been really helpful in developing me. Actually, quite recently, um, and the reason why it's quite recently is because of something I want to say before we get into it, and it's basically for any non-readers out there, right? Because I discovered, and I know this isn't new technology, but I, when I say discovered, I gave something a chance through, uh, coming up to three years ago, and it's changed my life, and that is just audiobooks. Right. I know some people are like with their pens poised thinking I was going to write that down, but that's not very revolutionary. So I won't bother. But just I, I grew up surrounded by great leaders and just great men and women of God. And I know from watching their lives that leaders, you know, we the phrase is leaders are readers. Right. And I would be people would be saying about this book and that book. And I would be like, yes, I'm going to do that. And I would really try, Chris. But I was just not good at it. I just, I don't know why I didn't get the traction. It wasn't that I didn't like reading Christian books or I didn't like reading leadership books. I just didn't really read. I love stories. But even as a child, like my dad, I've got two brothers, right? An older and a younger brother. And like my dad would read us stories, even when we were teenagers. Like we, he read us, Lord, he read us The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings when we were like secondary school age. We would like after tea, 
we'd like when it was getting towards bedtime, we'd get our pajamas on and we would lie on the couch and he would just read the story to us. So I love stories. I just, I don't know if that meant that I didn't bother then re- reading perhaps. Maybe it's my dad's fault. Anyway, <laughs> but audio books, someone said to me, you really should try it. And I was like, oh, I don't know. Anyway, I tried it for a month and it just like, I've read more books in the last three years than I did in the preceding 45 years. Yeah. Oh, so, I, yeah. Shout out to the people that struggle who are listening to podcasts going, I'm a terrible leader. I, I had a kind of a similar awakening to audiobooks around about, I think it was about seven years ago or so. And I just started realizing that actually I, do, I, I find it difficult to find time to, to pick up a book. But if I'm pottering around the house and doing things, I can easily put a, an audiobook in. Um, and I, it turns out you, the pottering becomes a lot uh, more fun because now, you know, I'm doing the washing up or something. I can listen to something whilst I'm doing it and uh, it's actually more interesting or if I'm mowing the grass or something, just, yeah, absolutely. So it, it was a, a great thing for that. Um, and and also I find that when I read, it's normally to help me get to sleep. <laughs> so if I pick up a book, I'm kind of starting to, you know, my eyes are starting to go. And so it's it's one of those things where I think audiobooks have been really good for me. Uh, and also you can, if you're really kind of uh, hyper- uh efficient you can put it on that kind of 1.25 speed or 1.5 speed and it just goes that a little bit quicker but it's still you get into the rhythm of it and yeah, you can actually yeah, yeah. hear it fine i'm a 1.3er that's my limit any faster than that i'm not getting it but i turned 40 in 2016 and along with a few other things i started to take um the need to exercise a bit more seriously so i started running this the point i'm making and so I was already running um, and, and and over, you know, the years, I developed that into quite a strict daily habit. So now I run for about 35 to 40 minutes every day, apart from Sunday, seven kilometers. That's what I do. And so I was all, I already had that habit in place. And then I uh, read a summary of a book, Atomic Habits, that um, many people have read. And he, in that book, he talks about habit stacking. So if you've already got a habit, like add one on top. And I was listening to podcasts while I was running. And then I was like, oh yeah, maybe, a, uh, which I was enjoying, maybe an audio book is basically just a, like a podcast. And, that, and that's when I tried it. So now I've got basically two things happening at the same time that I just, I just guarantee I do six, maybe sometimes five, but you know, five to six times a week, that's what I'm doing for 35 minutes. And it's, it's changed my life. No, I, I great idea. I, and and actually, you know, you know, that's a book that's been uh, recommended before on the pod. And I think, you know, um, Atomic Habits. And I think that's absolutely right. If you can put it together and habit stack, as you said, I think it's a great idea. Um, should we go and talk about, yes. talk about the first audio book that you've um, you really... <laughs> um, you've Sorry, you asked really me that question about 45 minutes ago. <laughs> I'm going to answer right. it. Yeah, so I was kind of looking at all the books that I'd read and I'm talking about the last three years here, and um, and I put them into four categories, right? Leadership, human behavior, which is just absolutely fascinating to me, and um, in the spirit of leadership development, that is something that I definitely want to study further in, in the future. Um, so leadership, human behavior, communication. Um, I'm, a, I'm a preacher, I'm a public speaker, I speak to groups of people all the time, so that's really interesting to me. And then just old school pastoral ministry, right? So the first book is out of the leadership category. And I could have chose, Chris, I could have chose 4,000 Weeks by Oliver Berkman. That's brilliant. Predictable Success by Liz uh, Les Keown. Um, I'm just showing off now because I've read books for three years. So I, I feel want... like it's a bit, it's that kind of, um, here's what you could have won. Yeah. You know, uh, I'm just flexing. I just want people to know that I read books <laughs> these days because I felt guilty for so many years. Um, the Netflix book is brilliant. No rules, rules by Reed Hastings. Anyway, the one that I've chosen and it's one I've read more recently is called Extreme Ownership. Extreme Ownership by Leif Babin and Jocko Willink. Brilliant. Okay, talk to me about uh, Extreme Ownership. What's the the premise of the book? Um, I mean, it is what it says on the tin in in that it's talking about the power of ownership. Uh, Leif Babin and Jacko Willink are ex Navy SEALs, 
And so they basically, after coming out of the army and spending, you know, many, many tours in Afghanistan and places like that, they um, looked at all the lessons they'd learned and decided, hey, we could we could teach some non-military, you know, some civvies um, these principles because they actually cross over. And so now they travel around all these corporations in America and talk to these CEOs and, you know, really help with leadership. And then obviously someone said, you should write a book. And so they, they put it into a book. And it's, it is so, it's, well, number one, it's very sobering, right? Because extreme ownership by its nature um, just forces you to point all of the fingers back at yourself, all of the fingers back at yourself. And so all the excuses, all the reasoning, all the blame, all the whatever come back on you. So it's very sobering. Uh, number two, it was, it was just, uh, really simple you know when you just like you just need something profound because some of the other books that I've read you know especially on human behavior they're like okay I'm running down the street because I'm listening to it while I'm running I'm like right stop pause you know rewind what like say that again Jordan Peterson or whatever you know what I'm saying it's like this is crazy but these guys it's like simple but really profound and super easy to like cross over so and 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 it's them reading it. You know, on audiobooks, it's not always the author that reads it, right? Well, it's them guys. And and they sound like Navy SEALs. And um, it's like, you know, we were in Ramadi in, in Iraq, as they say it. And, you know, we were penned down by enemy fire. And, and they just tell these, like, incredible stories. And then they... So it's at each point starts with a, a war story. Then it's flipped over to a business story, as in, like, oh... I applied this principle to such and such a company when I, I met their CEO and then they do that. And then it's kind of finished with like questions about how it might apply to you in your context. And um, it's really good because I find myself in meetings. I don't know about you, but I'm in meetings from the minute I wake up to the minute I go to bed. It feels <laughs> like sometimes. And I find myself in meetings like about to say something and then just go in, extreme ownership would not say that and I have to sort of stop myself and that's the first application and then unfortunately for the team around me I've now started saying to them nah you you can't that's that's not going to help us you got to own this mate you got to you know and it's not just and it's called extreme ownership because it is extreme because you know there's lots of complex moving parts in any organization isn't there and, and the church included and you know you can't just shoulder it all but it's yeah i would fully recommend both reading it getting your team to read it and then talking about how you as a team can actually work that out and i haven't told the team to read it but i um the plan is that we're all going to read it next term and that will be our focus yeah yeah it's brilliant i'd love to dive into those kind of things that you said those those things where you think oh, i can't i won't say that because of what you've learned through the book what are some of those things? I think to, to kind of bring that out, I think would be really helpful. Well, I think we have a blame culture in in society. Um, and we can, you know, not from a, of a, a wicked kind of evil heart, but, you know, with every good intention, we can basically throw over people under the bus or, or try to highlight in, in the area of, of, a, pro, of, of a problem area, how it wasn't you, which has got some validity probably because you need to get to the bottom of what went wrong or why it didn't work or why it wasn't as good as it could be. But actually from a personal perspective, I'm only in charge of how I operate. So even if let's say that, you know, we have this endeavor, we try it and it fails and it actually isn't my fault. It's actually one of my, like the way that they call it in the book is your subordinates. I don't know if we're happy with that term in church leadership. It feels a bit like, well, militant because yeah. it's, from the, it's from the military. <laughs> but um, like, let's say a team member, really, they drop the ball. It's like I'd have been in a meeting where I'd have said, you know, well, you didn't do this. But extreme ownership says you don't say that. You say, hey, I'm really sorry because I didn't lead you in a way that enabled you to do x y and z and i gotta take my responsibility for that and the principle works if everybody does it because then the person who hears that doesn't go yeah 
it was your fault. You didn't help me enough. They go, okay, I hear you and I appreciate what you're saying, but let me just own my section of it. So it kind of only works, which is why it's problematic that the team haven't read it yet. <laughs> uh, it's kind of only works if everybody agrees to it. Like we're going to be an extreme ownership organization. Um, and it's just, it's a way of talking as well as a way of thinking. Like you didn't do this changes to, hey, I didn't help you do this. Yeah, I think it's, there's something that even at the, you know, like you said, you've read it and maybe, you, you know, your team haven't read it. But even at that, that base level of, of you just going, do you know what? I'm not shifting blame. That it models something that I think is really quite, uh, quite refreshing and healthy. Uh, and okay. even uh, even if they haven't read it, hopefully then there's something that gets passed on to go, hang on a minute, maybe that's a to own your own, you know, your own part of it, even if it wasn't your fault at all, to own yeah. the bit that, you know, because especially if you're leading people, you're, uh, like you said, you are, you're accountable for it, even if you weren't responsible. Yeah. So I, I think that extreme ownership seems, um, yeah, really, really important. And that's something that I think everyone probably could learn from. Yeah, I mean, it's the difference between blame and responsibility or, or fault and responsibility. You know, good leaders recognize that if something's not your fault, it doesn't mean it's not your responsibility. Hmm. And we're obsessed with blame, aren't we? You know, where there's a blame, there's a claim, that's the culture. And so we can quickly do that. Whereas I think leaders serve others better by going, okay, this wasn't my fault, but how can I take responsibility for what happened in some way to ensure that together it doesn't happen again, that kind of thing. It does sound like a little bit of a negative like outlook, but you know, we organizations are complex, aren't they? And they've got moving parts and human hearts in the mix, which just makes everything more complicated, which is why the human behavior category for the next book is is so important to me because we're not just an organization, we're not a machine. Um We've got we've got those pesky things called human beings in the mix that make everything harder and better. Yeah, well, it probably makes a perfect segue to to move on to the second resource. Then, um, talk to me about the second book that you've that you brought with you. Okay, so I could have said, should we do that again? Six Go for it. Types, six types of working genius by Patrick Lencioni was brilliant. Julie Smith wrote a brilliant book called Why Has No One Told Me This Before which is just so helpful in understanding people. Seven Primal Questions by Mike Foster. And then, you know, 12 Rules for Life, John Peterson, some of that stuff is just like, you don't, you have to pause it while you're running, but it, it definitely helps. But anyway, the one I've chosen to share is called Surrounded by Idiots by Thomas Erickson, Surrounded by Idiots. Okay, so we were talking about... Um... Uh, extreme ownership before and now he said let's still look at our human behavior and this book is called surrounded by idiots i think you're probably gonna have to unpack what the idea of this book is okay so i was at, i was on holiday in tenerife right and um the hotel where we were staying we didn't choose it was uh, a very kind gift from you know someone else because we went with family and so it was a hotel that was full of lads and girls in their 20s who were enjoying the party scene in Tenerife. And so the pool was like just loads of, you know, these crazy young adults doing what they do. And I noticed, well, firstly, that one of them was reading a book, a paper book, which was I was impressed with because they didn't seem to me with my judgmental hat on, like they would, they didn't look like readers, they looked like drinkers. But anyway, so I was slightly curious about that. And when he went off to the pool or to the loo or whatever, I kind of had a little peek at what it was. I didn't pick it up. But the cover, and it said surrounded by idiots. And that that's obviously a, you know, emotive, evocative kind of title. So I was like, what is that? And so I Googled it. And it, it's um, Thomas Erickson is this guy. And he has a, 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 a series of books surrounded by. Um, and there's lots of different things. And this one is kind of like broadly speaking about human behavior. And he tells this story in the book. Um, about a, a leader of a company that he was trying to help. And the quote surrounded by idiots come from this guy. He was like, oh, I need your help with this, you know, organization. My staff are, they're all idiots. No, no one knows what they're doing. I'm the only person in this organization who's, you know, 
knows the backside from their elbow, blah, blah, blah. And so the, you know, this Thomas Erickson said, well, rather than calling them idiots, why don't we just have a look at what, tell me about them. And so he started to describe the personalities, the behaviors, the, the habits of the people around him. And Thomas Erickson said, they're actually not idiots. They're just different to you. And the whole book is about exploring. And it's not a new, uh, a new science at all. It's a retake or a reframing of something that I've heard for years, 20 years ago, about, you know, human behavior being categorized into four groups. And those four groups have got different names depending on who's describing them. But in this book, they use he uses colors, red, blue, green, yellow, um, for, you know, these broad categories of personality type and explores each one of them and how we have a, a primary a primary color that would, would represent our personality and probably a secondary one as well. And it was just so interesting because I work with, you know, the team here at our church, church 17 years old, but even beyond that, we've known each other for 25 plus, some of us, years, um, years long, what am I saying? <laughs> a long time is what we're saying. We've known each other for a long time. And so it was so uh, interesting and helpful to me to understand the people around me, um, understand myself, understand Zoe, and how to interpret the way they are, their behavior, um, how to get the best out of them, what situations or ways that I can be that will make them feel threatened or scared or, or uncomfortable versus ways that I can be because of their according to this book, colour, but that represents kind of, broadly speaking, these four categories of, of personality type or behaviour. Um, and it was just, Chris, I'm telling you what, if you read it, you would instantly know what colour you are and you would instantly know some of the closest people around you, what colour they are, and that just helps. Now, the temptation is to then wield that knowledge as some kind of weapon, <laughs> And just be like, oh, you're being so blue about it, you know. And, and you know, tongue in cheek, I did that. I was like, oh, you're so green. But actually, it's a really great tool for you personally to understand yourself and un understand those around you. It's not really long um, and it's not super complicated. There's a lot of complicated science behind it. But he's done all that work. And I think they, I'm going to say a figure here that's a guess. So... I don't know what the figure is, but he interviewed something like a hundred or 500,000 people over 20 years or something to get this study um, and the credibility that goes behind it. So, you know, I'm trusting the, uh, you know, the back page where it tells you all the science comes from, but it's, it, it's really good, Chris. Brilliant. I'd love to find out what, um, what color are you and what, what does, and what do those kind of colors correspond to? Okay. So broadly speaking, Red is like um, like a what's the word that we would use in another different language for the same kind of thing is like choleric. Have you familiar okay. with like melancholic choleric? Yes. Like yeah. Okay, so red is like in the most part that sort of choleric leader, um, visionary, strong, charismatic, you know, almost domineering leader. Uh, which I am not. Uh, blue is a little bit of the melancholic personality type that you might have heard before. There's like the, there's there's elements of creativity in that, um, you know, kind of, and weirdly, um, uh, think like thinking, like analytical thinking, which you wouldn't think goes together with creativity, but. It, it often does and thinking about a guy in our church who studied medicine so to do that you have to be fairly um i don't know pragmatic i guess or analytical in study and but he's also an unbelievable musician who can just play any instrument without trying and he's just a blue personality to the nth degree so red and blue and then you've got green which is this kind of like i think in the in the the other language is that that phlegmatic personality type that that doer 
that um you know i don't need the spotlight don't 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 i don't need attention i just you know i'm just faithful i'm consistent i'm solid my wife is green to the nth degree and then there's yellow i'm tempted to say the best because i am yellow yellow is like um extroverted silly funny feelingsy you know sensitive to a fault sometimes kind of personality. So I would be predominantly yellow and I've become red over time because of the people that I spend time with. I spend mm -hmm. the time with a lot of red people. Pastor Glynn is red. Pastor Stuart Kia is red with blue. Glynn is red with yellow. He's like leader strong, but he's also just funny and, you know, will will be silly whereas i'm more yellow like you know kind of sensitive feelingsy funny silly but i've had to become more red over time and i surround myself with blue people to do the stuff that i that just sends me to sleep did i do all four i think i did yes that's yeah all four I, i'm really interesting and i yeah seeing how it links to the kind of some of the kind of more traditional categories i think is is absolutely fascinating um yeah really interesting to see how that works how has it worked for you with maybe looking at your team um have you have you done this exercise with your team how's that kind of worked out how has it helped you understand yourself and your team better really um okay so let me give you an example of of my leaders so glenn i don't know for those who don't know you probably should listen to this podcast the boss of our church and also Assemblies of God is the national leader. He's a red personality type and they do not cope well or you don't get the best out of them if you remove them from all the decisions. Now, neither are they um, excited by being in the micro decisions as well. Um, and so I, I have to, when I'm interacting with him, I'm trying to ascertain is this a, um, you just want the information and then that's all you need. You don't need anything else. Or this is a discussion. Like we're actually going to go some back and forth here because um, it's important to him to, it's important to me to know which type of conversation we're having here. And a red personality type is sometimes like, all right, A, B and C. Just tell me what it equals. That's it. Don't, this is not a negotiation or a conversation. And then there's other times when a red personality type is like, okay. And because Glyn is also yellow as well, he's, he's pastoral as a second sort of personality type. He, there's times when he's like, okay, he just says something and I give a short answer and he's like, yeah, but come on. Like what we want some back and forth here. So I think that's, you know, those kinds of scenarios uh, are really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, I think I work with a lot of blue personality type people, right, who are analytical and and I'm, you know, it's helpful for me to know that when they're talking about information and I'm talking about feelings, two things about that. One is that they, they might, I might ask a question about feelings and they answer with facts which are very different. Um, so I have to make sure that, um, again, I understand what kind of conversation we're having, but I also, Chris, because yellow is my strength, it's also my gift to the blue person. So I can almost force them, isn't the right word. It's not a very yellow way to be. Red people force things. Yellow people are a bit more like not forcing, but I, I feel like it's my job to say to a blue person, feelings matter because blue yeah. people have feelings they just keep them they've, they've got as much introverts and not all blues are introverted but introverts have as much going on as extroverts it's just internal mm. so as a yellow who all my stuff is external i if i'm going through something everyone around me unfortunately for them is going through it but a blue person i, I feel like my gift to them and it probably doesn't feel like a gift sometimes 
but all like on New Year's Eve or on my birthday or, you know, times where you like, you know, I love you and you say all this meaningful stuff. Most people say, you know, I, it matters to me how much you care. Whereas in the moment, it's like, oh, why are you going on about how I feel? Shut up. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. And like a green person, like Zoe, my wife, she does not cope well with spontaneity. Like a surprise party for her is not good. So it means that if we have a last minute change of arrangements for a green person, that is like, can, can almost be interpreted as like, you don't value me because you, you didn't communicate. So a mm. green person needs massive communication early. Otherwise they feel something that you didn't intend. I could talk about it all day, Chris, because I find it so interesting. And I, if I was 18, I would I would study psychology or counseling or both or something. Yeah. No, it sounds a fantastic book. Uh, it's uh, Surrounded by Idiots by Thomas Erickson. Um, great. great. Let's move on to your, your third resource. What's the third one you brought with you? OK, so the third category, because like one was leadership, one was human behavior. I had four categories. The fourth one was pastoral ministry where I've read books like The Pastor by Eugene Peterson, um, John Mark Comer's book on discipleship, Practicing the Way is Brilliant. And I read a book by a, a real-life shepherd. His name's James Rebanks, and he, he um, he's a shepherd in the Lake District. And he wrote a book called The Shepherd's Life, which for, for pastors, especially ministry gift pastors, that's a great book to read. It's not about people, it's about sheep, but the parallels are amazing. Anyway, the third category is communication, because I, I speak to and in front of people often and um are communicating for a change is brilliant by andy stanley i read a brilliant book the last book i read was called super communicators um oh i forgot to write the author down i'll i'll try and find it in a second but the one that i want to highlight is called story worthy story worthy by a guy called matthew dix right well talk to me about story worthy um what's the idea around it obviously it's about communication but uh what's yep. the what's the angle on on this one well, it's absolutely not, just like the Super Communicators book that I said, it's not about public speaking. So if you're listening to this thinking, oh, I'm already a good preacher, or oh, I don't really preach, then don't write this off. It's actually, um, Super Communicators is about the art of conversation, and Storyworthy is essentially about the same, about the art of conversation, but through the medium of, of being able to tell stories. Um, it's quite curious and quite hard to explain there's a storytelling movement in America. So you know how, like, you know, everyone understands the performance of a song or perhaps a, po a poem, and we've probably all embraced the, the art of spoken word. Like another sort of string in that bow, that genre, is actually they have these storytelling competitions. And it's, it's not a poem, it's not a song, you're just literally telling a story and it's, you know, you have five minutes or four minutes or whatever it is. And they tell these stories and he's like a double grand slam prize winning storyteller. Um, and he's not really trying to recruit storytellers for competitions. He talks about the power of stories. And we know that, you know, as Christians, that, that that's what Jesus did. He told stories, parables, and there's parables in the Old Testament as well. Um you know, these stories that are, they're made up stories, but they communicate a point. Um, so I think it's, it's important. No, I think it's really meaningful um, as Christians to, to understand the power of story. But then also because of my love for humans, as per the previous book, um, stories are a great way of connecting with, with others and also drawing out stories from others. So I'll give you a super quick example, right? He does this exercise in the book called First Worst, um, Best, Last, or in whatever order, First, Last, Worst, Best. And he says, like, draw a table on a page and put at the top First, Last, Worst, Best, four columns. And then down the left-hand side, just write 10 random things like pet, girlfriend, job interview, holiday, you know, whatever. And then you go left to right and you go, right, girlfriend first. And then you write down, oh yeah, it was like Suzanne at primary school. We kissed 
you know, behind the bike sheds or whatever. Uh, last, oh, my wife, you know, she is my last girlfriend because now she's my wife. Um, worst, you know, and you, you kind of do it. And what it does is it like brings out like these stories that, you know, we think stories are like these epic things that happens. And to have a story to tell, it has to be that you climbed Mount Everest or you, you know, you single-handedly wrestled a car thief <laughs> or, or you, you know, you rescued, rescued people from human trafficking. I mean, I've got friends that do these amazing jobs and I think they have stories. But this book taught me that I actually have good stories because most good stories just happen in everyday life. You just don't really remember. And so this exercise forces you to do that. So what's happened since then, I've been to at least three parties, a birthday party, like a Thanksgiving meal, and then a Christmas meal where like, you know, everyone's talking and chatting, but like Glenn said to me at one of the meals, he was like, do something. And I was like, what do you mean? It's like, like everyone's talking individually, like do something to get everyone talking. And I was like, uh, okay, so, you know, banged a glass, you know, ching, ching, ching type thing. I said, okay, we're going to put everyone's name in a, in a bowl. And um, if you know name gets drawn out, you're going to tell the first, worst, last, best of a category that everyone's going to pick. So I said, right, so we drew out the first name and it was, you know, one of our team. And I said, okay, you're going to tell us the first, worst, last, best in a category that we're going to choose now. And people were like, what do you mean? And so they eventually got it and they were like, okay, uh, preaching faux pas, times when you've been preaching and you said something wrong or you swore by accident or you said the wrong verse or whatever, or like times you've, I don't know, needed the loo in public and had to make an excuse, whatever. And so we went round and it was just so good and so funny. And even the introverted, like, oh no, I don't, I don't really like doing that or I'm not a funny guy or I'm not a preacher everybody engaged with it and it was just a really great way of connecting so i've got that and that's just one example of the many things in the book that's like up my sleeve when i'm in situations where i feel like i need to now i don't have any problem thinking of something to say but i'm talking about you know those that might struggle and things like that so it's really interesting and really great i think what i love about it is it, it provides a really quick and easy way to like like you said to just tell a story because you know um you know like you said you could be what's your first job you know and you can talk about you know we, we all had terrible first jobs you know I think yeah. my 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 first job I think was a I worked in a place where I had to take paper clips out of paper now that's a story uh I'm... exactly <laughs> but if you wrote that on a on a on a movie poster somewhere no one would watch that but this, no. that, that's his genius Matthew Dix yeah. he's trying to say the job with the paper clips and the paper is a great story yeah. because, you know, there'll be, you'll remember something meaningful about it. Like the fact that you only did it. I'm just making this up, Chris, but like you only did it because you were skinned, but you did it for six weeks and you got enough money to buy a blah, blah, blah. What, you know, yeah, whatever yeah. you yeah. remember all the spinoffs and his thing is basically like, so here's one of his award-winning stories is about when he nearly died. He had a car accident, went through the windscreen, nearly died. But the genius of that story is not about that. It's actually about a moment in hospital where his the the emergency room doors open and he sees all his mates in the corridor who've come to the hospital because he's had this accident. And it's really emotional. And it's like, it's not even about the drama of this flying through the windscreen and the glass. It's about that emotional moment when he sees my friends love me. And you're like, I thought the story was about the car crash and the story is not about the paper clips. The story is about something else. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I love that. I think that, and, and looking for, you're looking for the kind of the, the deeper meaning in the everyday story. And uh, I, I think that's brilliant. And I'm I, clearly, this is a, something that's very, very helpful for even for public speaking, you know, whenever you need to find a story, I mean, there's, you know, every preacher needs a, a sermon illustration. So yeah. it's going to be helpful for for public speaking, but also just for everyday conversation. Everyone loves uh, a story or, you know, in a party situation, you, you know, you're just uh, making conversation, telling little anecdotes. And I think there's something about that, that um, that, that uh, ability to be able to share stories with one another is, is how we uh, grow connections. And, uh, you know, even put it into a church context, you know, in a small group, that you, straight away you can get people connecting over 
stories in their life. Um, well, so, yeah. They're, they're very disarming, aren't they? Stories. Mm. You kind of like, but they're also, they also foster vulnerability because you, you have to start talking about yourself or your thoughts or whatever. And, you know, and the Bible says, you know, we overcome by the blood of the lamb, you know, the power of what Jesus did for us on the cross. But then the word of our testimony, in other words, the story of how that blood has impacted our lives. So this is right up my street. It's human behavior. It's like funny because I'm a yellow personality type. It's okay. I'm going to own the fact that this is perhaps an awkward moment and I'm going to try, you know what I'm saying? It's right mm. up there. It's brilliant. Brilliant. Okay. That's uh, story worthy by Matthew Dix and a great three excellent resources there. Almost you could say like a trio of, of ice cream. Yeah. Uh, one could say. Yes. So, three uh, scoops. In a three scoops. Never in a cone, by the way. I should have clarified earlier. Waffle is equally of the devil. A chocolate ice cream <laughs> scoop in a waffle cone. That's you yeah. as well not bother. But I, three scoops in a tub. Yeah, I, I have actually started moving to tub recently because it's yeah. just it's also it just gets everywhere in a cone, doesn't it? It's just it's just a mess. Um brilliant. Uh Paul, thank you so much for joining me today. Really, really enjoyed it. Uh, thank you for your time and uh, no I will catch you soon yeah god bless you thanks for doing this Chris it's helping us all thank you for listening to this episode of that CPD show for more episodes why not subscribe and give us a review it really helps us out see you next time